Between its cancellation in 1989 and eventual reboot in 2005, a different attempt was made to revive the shambling corpse of British children's science fiction show Doctor Who. Intended to function as a backdoor pilot for a potential television run, Doctor Who the TV movie aired on Fox in 1996. In the opening scene of the film, the Doctor sets one foot on US soil and immediately gets shot by a gun. That sounds like the beginning of a stand-up set about what American Doctor Who would be like, and it's literally what happens. I'm obsessed with this movie. To continue setting the scene, the Doctor gets shot, and luckily one of the local youths involved in the shootout he landed in the middle of calls an ambulance for him. But the doctors at the hospital aren't equipped for his alien biology, and he dies on the operating table. His body is moved to the hospital morgue. The mortician in the next room over is watching Frankenstein on TV, when something in the morgue starts trying to get out. Briefly, the framing is that of a horror movie, and the man who cannot die is a suitable monster. Soon enough, though, the monster has escaped, and the doctor emerges into the world, amnesiac, his mind shattered by the trauma of her generation. This movie is many things, but subtle is not one of them. On his way to the hospital, the doctor accosts Grace Holloway, the surgeon who operated on him earlier and the companion for this story. Paul McGann is immediately electric in this role, simultaneously alien and endearing. As the two talk, we learn that the doctor still has the medical probe from the attempted surgery embedded in his chest. It's viscerally upsetting imagery, at least for me, even on repeat viewings. The body horror here is a huge part of what fascinates me about this movie. The engagement with regeneration is a process not just emotional and interpersonal, but material. Sure, the doctor can die and keep living, but he can never escape the violence of death. He can never outrun his past. In the modern iteration of the show, regeneration is visually represented by this golden energy that explodes out from the doctor. There's a total obliteration of the physical body into magic and light. You're not supposed to think too hard about the processes at play beyond the metaphorical. In the days before CGI, on the other hand, it was a simple fade from one actor's face to another's. Here it's somewhere in between. We see the actor's faces the whole time, but we also get electricity over the top. The forces reanimating the Doctor are not otherworldly. They are the same electricity Victor Frankenstein used. Not that long ago, Frankenstein, as a motif, made a return in Doctor Who. The episode where the Doctor meets Mary Shelley leads directly into a plotline about reanimated Cybermen and a scientist who cares little for the creature she raised as her own child. So the Doctor is Frankenstein's monster in this way too, the wronged, inhuman other. Of course, none of that was at all conceived of when the TV movie was being written. Still, it can't not inform my reading of the film. I am told that these stories are contiguous, that they are one and the same. In some ways, I want to be the person who insists that the series 12 finale has no more bearing on the TV movie than any given Doctor Who fanfic, but I don't really feel that way emotionally. The fact that society writ large puts value on the official version of the story makes such a claim ring hollow. Maybe that's part of why the film's tone feels so strange. The medical horror and gun violence and everything combine into something that feels thoroughly unlike the versions of Doctor Who that came before or after. All of the individual pieces are here. The Doctor, the TARDIS, the circuitous sci-fi logic of the plot. But that isn't enough. Something is off. The violence feels all the more visceral because it's Doctor Who. It feels like some unspoken rule has been broken that surely this is not a character that this kind of thing can happen to. It's funny. I came of age within a media landscape where the gritty adult reboot was ever present to the point of parody, where those versions were often my earliest exposures to a franchise. The ways in which this subversion of expectations can be genuinely effective isn't something I've experienced much. Of course, in today's era of sprawling cinematic universes, tonal dissonance between installations isn't uncommon. A New Hope and Andor aren't trying to hit the same tone. But Doctor Who the TV movie isn't a side spin-off, or one entry in a tangled web of continuity the way a Star Wars or Marvel movie is now. It's a direct, singular continuation. This is what Doctor Who is now, it says. This is what it always has been. The movie it was responsible to no one but itself. For better or worse, it casts a longer shadow than Andor ever could. During the surgery, Grace had noticed that her patient seemed somehow to have two hearts. She knows it can't be true. She spends the rest of the film's runtime learning to believe the impossible. 
Grace is one in a long line of Doctor Who companions and pseudo-companions who work in medicine, and the resonance there is obvious. It makes her a parallel, an equal to the Doctor, but in this case, her job has other narrative significance as well. In that first scene of hers, it gives her power over him. The Doctor needs her to rescue him. He lives and dies by her hand, and that is core to our dynamic going forward. Her trust in him is still tenuous when the Doctor's memories return. The question I can't help but wonder throughout all this is, who is the audience for this movie supposed to be? I can't imagine the Doctor's ramblings here, never mind the entire regeneration plot, make much sense at all if you're not already familiar with the series. But like, was the accent American fanbase of Doctor Who in the 90s really big enough to sustain a TV show? I guess it turned out the answer was no. What's the Eye of Harmony? It's the power source at the heart of the TARDIS. The TARDIS? What's a TARDIS? The TARDIS is my ship. It carries me through time and space. Uh, and this master, is he like the devil? The master is a rival Time Lord. Time Lord. Pure oh evil. God. In a way, the movie is ahead of its time. Plots so reliant on earlier franchise installations that they're near impenetrable to newcomers is functionally the dominant form of storytelling in Hollywood now. And I think that's a bad thing. And also, I'd be lying if I said I didn't love it here. This stuff makes money for a reason. It's fun to recognize the thing you know. But more importantly, a pre-established canon opens possibilities that are absent in an original story. An established narrative comes built in with motifs and ideas and themes before the story even starts. The new creative team to make use of or subvert as needed. A dialogue spanning decades. The problem with our current media landscape isn't the existence of stories built on the foundations of earlier ones, it's that such projects get funded and produced to the exclusion of original works. You don't get Doctor Who in 1996, or in 2023, without the weird, unlikely little show that was Doctor Who in 1963. While the Doctor was working through his identity issues, the teenager who got him to the hospital, his name is Lee, was conning the hospital staff into giving him the personal effects the Doctor had on him when he died. There's this great editing moment where the film cuts right from Lee with the bag of stolen goods to the doctor stealing clothes from the hospital. The parallel makes clear that while the doctor not having access to his sonic screwdriver, TARDIS key, and everything is a problem, we're not meant to see the theft in and of itself as immoral. It's maybe worth acknowledging explicitly that there's a definite undertone of orientalism to the way the movie frames with Lee as a character and Chinatown as a location. Still, Lee feels like an individual. His overall role as not quite companion, not quite villain means he's actually a much more complex character than anyone else in this story. Lee soon gets recruited by the actual antagonist of the piece, which brings me to what I consider to be this movie's cardinal sin. It manages to make the master an uninteresting villain. A lot of recurring Doctor Who villains are in fact entire species of aliens, but the master is a character, and a surprisingly nuanced and consistent one at that. When I watched the classic Who episodes they first appeared in, I was shocked by just how fully formed the character was, right off the bat. Certainly, they've evolved over the years, but the layers of complicated emotions, if only and what ifs, they're all there. Along with plenty of bizarre, campy villainy. My point here is that the movie doesn't have the excuse of predating our modern understanding of the Master as a tragic figure. They could have made him more three-dimensional here, and chose not to. Instead, he's... well... <sighs> Before the Doctor gets shot, before the TARDIS lands in San Francisco, we actually open with a voiceover explaining that the Master has died. He demanded that I, the Doctor, a rival Time Lord, should take his remains back to our home planet, Gallifrey. Once the Doctor is out of the way, though, the Master's consciousness emerges from the urn of his ashes as this horrible CGI goo snake? And then later, he possesses a guy who, on both of my first two viewings, I thought was Grace's boyfriend, but it's actually just a rando who works at the same hospital? I cannot follow this subplot for the life of me. Beyond just how strange the literal methods of his schemes are, though, the real problem is that this master doesn't work with this doctor. The actor is bringing this intense, cartoonish energy to scenes where the rest of them, and McGann especially, are playing it much more grounded. The two of them don't have any real chemistry. For that matter, they're not even in the same room until, like, two-thirds of the way through the movie. In any good master story, the dynamic between the two of them would be the engine powering the narrative, and here it just isn't. That said, I did read one review of the movie that praised this version of the master for a reason that hadn't even occurred to me. The mere fact that he's not trying to be an exact copy of the classic master. This was an innovation at the time. While multiple actors played the part across the classic show's run, they were always supposed to be playing the same regeneration, the same character. 
New Who has instead settled on having the master regenerate alongside the Doctor, each actor and writer getting to put their own spin on the part. Arguably, Doctor Who 1996 is what we have to thank for that. Here's something else I haven't mentioned yet about this movie. It's a Y2K story. The events I've described are taking place on New Year's Eve 1999. The MacGuffin of the hour is an atomic clock. Luckily, Grace is on the board of a local science organization that is planning on starting up their fancy new clock at midnight that night, and she's able to get herself and the doctor into said organization's New Year's party, where this will be happening. Okay, so it's not a Y2K plot per se, the threatening apocalypse has nothing to do with the millennium bug, but it certainly evokes it. There was something in the air at the time, I suppose, the sense that the arrival of the year 2000 must be world-shattering. Paul McGann's Eighth Doctor is popular with a specific subset of die-hard Doctor Who fans. Not because of this movie so much, but because of the expanded universe material that followed novels and comics and audio dramas during the period where there was no Doctor Who on television. These stories, too, are knowledge one might bring with you to this movie. This is a tangent, but the thing you have to understand about the Doctor Who EU is it's kind of a fundamentally broken concept. Not that there isn't plenty of good stuff being made within it, but that Unlike something like Star Wars, Doctor Who doesn't really have a setting. Many episodes take place more or less in the real world, and the alien planets and far-flung futures of the more sci-fi stories almost never occur across eras of the show. They're not core to the franchise's identity. The only consistent through-line is the Doctor and the TARDIS. Some spin-offs solve this problem by thematizing the Doctor's absence, but a lot of the EU is just inserting more time into the life of this one guy. It requires a certain suspension of disbelief because like, no, the doctor didn't have another long-term companion between Donna's departure and the events of the 2009 specials. It completely breaks the emotional arc of that part of the show if that's the case. But for the space of this comic storyline, we're gonna take it as a given that he did because we wanna tell a story about the 10th doctor and that's the best space we've got to do it. To complicate things further, Doctor Who doesn't have an official canon. Let me clarify. There are people behind Marvel and Star Wars and Star Trek whose job it is to maintain consistency in their shared universe. But while the BBC certainly cares about maintaining the brand, the many texts that can be said to make up Doctor Who contradict one another frequently and joyously. Like, okay. The Star Wars fan wiki has these two tabs on every page where you flip between Disney-approved canon and so-called Legends continuity of the pre-Disney EU. Much like Star Wars, there was a period of time after Doctor Who's initial run where the expanded universe was free to do basically whatever its contributors wanted. I've often heard this period of time between versions of the show referred to as the wilderness years, which is delightfully melodramatic. While plenty of the modern show contradicts wilderness years canon, no one ever drew a hard line and said, this is real and this is not. Unlike Disney, the BBC didn't burn down this wilderness, they just planted new gardens on top of them. I don't mean to over-romanticize, there is still a garden wall between official and fan-made Doctor Who stories, and that will be the case as long as IP law continues to exist. Still, the Doctor Who wiki does not have two discrete boxes. Instead, contradictions are business as usual, and wiki pages often call them out in the text. For example, per the wiki, the Doctor has met Mary Shelley on three separate occasions, all of them on the same night. Quote, by one account, the night of the contest, the 13th Doctor Yasmin Khan, Ryan Sinclair, and Graham O'Brien knocked on the door, seeking shelter from the rain. This led to an encounter with Ashad, the lone Cyberman. By another account, while writing her story, Mary saw anomalous lightning out the window and left the lodge to investigate. Despite the 10th Doctor's attempts to save her, she was attacked by Zazik and fainted. In June 1816 at Villa Diodati, the 18-year-old Mary encountered two versions of the 8th Doctor simultaneously. The older of the two versions introduced himself as Dr. Frankenstein. When this older version appeared to have died, Percy suggested to make an experiment with lightning on the doctor's body. After the younger version of the doctor has helped the older one to recover, Mary left her future husband and their friends and spent years traveling with the younger version of the doctor. Indeed, Doctor Who 96 itself seems to contradict everything we know by having the doctor just kind of throw out there that I'm half human on my mother's side. This gets repeated by the Master as well. If it's a lie, it's one the Doctor has been telling for a while. The modern show is haunted by this idea. Never willing to confirm it, but always aware that it could. The Doctor now forever in a quantum superposition of being both half-human and not. Tell me, Doctor, I've always wondered. You're a Time Lord. You're a high-born Gallifreyan. Why is it you spend so much time on Earth? 
Doctor Who writer Paul Cornell has suggested that we could understand such inconsistencies as diegetic. That the reason the modern series contradicts the original is because reality was rewritten by the time war which took place between them. And by extension, smaller contradictions could be ripples caused by other time travel. I'm not sure how much I buy this idea when it comes to something like the Doctor's heritage, but there is a satisfying parallelism to it nonetheless. To think that the Doctor Who universe is as strange and contradictory and fluid for those living within it as for us watching. Paul McGann's only other on-screen appearance as the Doctor was a short release for the 50th anniversary in 2013, which captures the end of the Incarnation's life before the TV movie shows its beginning. He regenerates in the modern style, burning gold, and there's something jarring about it. It does feel like a kind of time travel, like someone's gone back and rewritten reality such that this is how this character's body works. Toward the end of the movie, the Master sets into motion the final stage of his plan to steal the Doctor's body. I'm alive! I'm alive! It's alive! It's alive! The allusions to Frankenstein run throughout the whole film. For the most part, Grace Holloway is our Victor Frankenstein, and the Doctor is her monster. In the novel, Victor's interest in science grew from a desire to, quote, banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death. For Grace... It was a childish dream that made you a doctor. You dreamt you could hold back death. And Frankenstein's creature, like our doctor, is nameless. The story of Frankenstein as it's been popularized has, of course, transformed significantly from the novel. The 1931 film adaptation, the one excerpted in the Doctor Who story at hand, hones in on themes of scientific hubris where the book is broader in its interest. The film changes the creature from an accusing antagonist to a shambling monster. At one point in Frankenstein, the novel, the creature reads Paradise Lost. I've never read Paradise Lost because sometimes you're in the middle of downloading a 19th century epic poem to make a video about the bad Doctor Who movie and you're like, wait, I literally don't need to do this. The specifics aren't what's important here anyway. When the creature describes how he sees himself in the poem's depictions of particular characters, that I understand. It's a charming moment of characterization for the creature, but I'm also fascinated by the fact that Frankenstein, itself so iconic and referenceable now, is making the same kind of references to its own predecessor. Frankenstein is, of course, a relevant intertext here beyond the direct references. As a forerunner of the modern science fiction genre, Doctor Who is perpetually in its debt. When the filmic version of Doctor Frankenstein is going on about the newly discovered wavelengths of light that allow him to bring his creation to life, it isn't hard to imagine him talking about reversing the polarity of the neutron flow. There is no work of fiction that isn't in dialogue with the other texts that came before, and yes, after it. What so fascinates me about Doctor Who 1996, though, is that it's almost nothing but intertextuality. None of the choices it makes would interest me if they didn't exist in the context they do, or I have such strong pre-existent feelings about the Doctor as a character. At the movie's climax, after the Master has killed both Grace and Lee, the Doctor finally gains the upper hand again. In the struggle, the Master falls into the power source at the center of the TARDIS. Give me your hand! And it's... Take my hand. Man, this movie could have been good. With the Master defeated, Doctor uses the TARDIS to reverse time and with it Grace and Lee's deaths. When the two are revived, they glow yellow bright. Rather like... Throughout this final sequence, we cut back and forth between the action in the TARDIS and the New Year's party. The contrast is comedic, except by the end, when the clock reaches midnight and the world keeps spinning. None of these people knew their lives were on the line, but they celebrate their survival anyway. Because it's New Year's, the year 2000, the new millennium, what unbelievable wonders might it hold? Watching this well into the 21st century does add a kind of bitter irony to the framing. The future becomes the past. Near future sci-fi always becomes outdated soon enough, and we all point and laugh at those idiots in the 90s who thought a calendar changing meant a fresh start. New Year's is not a reality. It has nothing to do with the physics of time and space. Rather, it's a story. When we tell over and over and over. Even when it makes no sense to. Because it's fun. Because it's nostalgic. Because despite everything, we're still here to tell it. Also, for some reason, this exchange is unbelievably funny to me. What? He's, um, he's British. Yes, I suppose I am. 